Okay. Should we start again? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, we start with the plan for today. Uh, let's have a look at it mm. on the fronter. Yeah, today should be the ninth, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, the plan. Oh, but uh, I plan to kind of solve this first exercise first. Then there will be a brief discussion on the next exercise, and then we start. Uh, Moving a little bit back and forth in the textbook, we start basically in chapter 3 doing a, uh, a repeat of this EOQ model, which you kind of was familiar with from the other logistics course, and then uh, we kind of shift focus and move into chapter 7 of the textbook. We will return to chapter 3 later on, okay, so, and ca chapter 4, so we, we kind of move a little bit back and forth. Now, so, uh, so uh, in order to kind of continue the first topic which we discussed last time of production planning, we kind of move into to more, uh, should we say, operational type of production planning, which is referred to as lot sizing here. So that is kind of the, the end point here. Uh, of course, lot sizing models, as they are normally described in logistics literature, may not seem especially appropriate for event problems, but I think it's necessary to kind of look into them, to just to kind of get some feeling for the technicalities here. They are kind of building blocks for other types of models, which we will look at as we move along. So that is the plan. Any questions? Comments? Everything is fine? Okay, that's good. Okay, let's... Um, look at uh, the exercise. Uh, I put up um, a solution here, it's uh, done here, but before we look at the solution let's look at the exercise text. No, that was not right, we should go here. Okay. Yeah, is this visible for you? Yeah. Uh, this first A question here was kind of um, a test on whether you were able to read some presumably unknown mathematics to kind of see if you were able to grasp that and kind of put it into action. That was the idea. I don't know what your experience is. Was this straightforward? It was not straightforward. Okay. Uh, is this the kind of common understanding that this was not straightforward to, to perform an induction proof? Yeah, that's okay. If you if that's what uh, your experience was, then I need to know, of course, because. Uh, but you, I, I presumably you tried to read this text, did you? Yeah. Yeah. So what was the problem there? With the text. Yeah. No, I kind of no problems with the text. Kind of taking the content on the text into practice was not that simple, perhaps. No. No. So yeah. Kind of how to do it? How to do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This induction proof kind of thing is, is basically relatively straightforward. Um, what you do is that you, you have something you want to prove. And the main problem in these topics is really not to do the induction proof, but to get this something you want to prove. Okay? So in the first place, if you look at this exercise here, where comes this one? Where is this one coming from? And this kind of theory says nothing about that. Okay? That's, not, uh, that's not the problem from this point of theory. It's, uh, angle. So, so that is mainly what is trickier, to kind of come up with these formula you want to prove. Okay? That, that, that needs some experience and some inspired guesswork and that kind of stuff. Okay? So maybe um, we should leave that. Okay? So in this case we have kind of given what we, sh we should prove. So the idea here is then to prove by induction 
that the sum here, if we sum the square or even or actually all numbers or all uh, integers add them together, then it should be possible to write this sum as this formula. That's the idea of this group. And the technique is actually fairly simple. We, we first start by checking that the formula starts for the first value of 1. And equals 1, that's the first thing we do. So let's start there, okay? So uh, the starting point 1 show that the formula is okay for i equals 1, okay? Then to show that, of course, we have to do th two things. First, we have to compute this sum directly without using this formula, and then second, we put n equal to 1 into the formula and show that the two answers are the same. That's uh, the simple uh, way to do it. So if we want to sum from i equals 1, and now, and uh, yeah, the, no, not for i equals 1, for n equals 1, sorry, I misprint there. You should sum it up to n equals 1 of i squared, and that's very simple, isn't it? It's just a single element in this sum. So the answer here is 1 squared, which is 1, okay? So uh, the left-hand side of, of the equation produces 1. And then uh, the second point, we have to enter 1 into the formula. To see, and compute and see if we get 1, okay? So next, set n equal to 1 into the formula. Of course, the reason why kind of this example came up here is the fact that th this is actually applied in the regression case. If you look at the special case where the x variable is time, then it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, so on. Okay, so then you can kind of utilize these formulas to change these, these uh, uh, linear regression formulas into uh, at least to some extent easier formulas. So let's put n equals to 1 into this formula, then we get 1 here times, and then we put 1 plus 1, and then we put 2 times 1, plus 1 divided by 6. And we probably see immediately here that 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 times 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3, 2 times 3 is 6, so we end up with 1, okay? So this is okay for the first starting point. The ID in an induction proof should be actually easy to understand, and as long as it works here, if we know, assume, that our formula works at a certain future point. And if we can prove that given that it works at that future point, also would work at the next future point, then it should work for any future point. That is the logic behind this. So, <coughs> the logic then, we assume that the formula works for, say, n, so that is an assumption we make, and then we want to show that for n plus 1. Okay, this is going to be by the end. Okay, so as long as we make this assumption and it turns out that it also works for this one, then they kind of are secure that it will work for any instance of a future time period. Or any future end to be exactly correct. Okay. That was the point of this little few pages of mathematics, basically. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, request, the question always remains, how do we actually do this? There are several ways of doing it. Let me show you what I did in the solution text here. Okay, so we go up on level here, and we go 
up another level and down to the solutions and look at the solution in this case. You see, I start here with equation 1 and 2 exactly as I did on the board here. This is exactly the same, no changes there. And then I say, then we assume that the formula holds for n equals k. I use a different letter to kind of signal that I'm kind of into the proof now. Okay, so I say, any future point, I let's call it k to kind of not keep it confused with the given n. That's just what I, what I obviously can do. So that means that my formula is the same, but I'd use k instead of n in equation 3 there. Okay, no, no, no real problems there, uh, presumably. And as it says here, we assume this, it holds for n, n equals to k, and then we try to show that the formula is correct for n equals to k plus 1. Of course, if n equals k plus 1, I have to change this on top here into k plus 1 here. Okay, agree? That's straightforward. And then, of course, I get my formula. But the trick then, at this point, is to do kind of what I'm doing here. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm splitting my sum into two parts. First, I construct a sum which sums from i equals 1 up to k of the given i square. But then, of course, I add the extra term which comes from the plus 1 here. You see that? And the reason why I do this is, is of course, that I, I have an assumption that I know that this part works. So here I can use my formula. Okay, that, that is the idea. And then as it says here, if I know, now I can insert this formula here. I know that the sum from i equals 1 to k of i square equals this formula. Then, of course, I can submit that instead of this sum here. So I take this expression, sorry, uh, including the uh, under the fraction here, and I put it in for this part here. And then I end up with the first part of this uh, smaller print here. You see, I have this part which came from that one, and then I have that part which comes from this one. I just add it together, okay? And the idea now is to do some algebra here, to kind of do some tricks with this, make some multiplications or whatever, and try to, to write it in a kind of more convenient way. So you see what I do here <coughs> is that I keep my fraction here, and then I expand this number here by multiplying on top with 6 and on bottom with 6. Then I construct a fraction from this one. That is allowed. So, maybe I should do it on the board. Maybe that's easier. Okay. Let me start at the beginning of, of equation 5 here. I used this one from my assumption that the formula worked for n equal to k. Okay? And then I kind of splitted this sum into this part, which I know the value for, and then I have to add this part. And then I say, in order to kind of draw these two numbers together, I have to kind of multiply this by 6 and divide by 6 to get a common yep. denominator here. And then I can add together. This is standard fraction computation, isn't it? So hopefully you know how to do that. Then we are at this point, k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 plus... And then I, I say, OK, these k... Uh, Vill, det betyder att jag inte skriver någon form av punkten där. Men det man gör här, för jag kan bara ta en som blir bättre ut. Så jag vet. Are you following me? I take this one, and I write it like this instead. And the reason is that I now I see I have a common factor here. I have a k plus 1 in both terms, so I can factorize here. And that's what's happening here. Okay, so I take k plus 1 as a common factor outside a big parenthesis here and I keep the k here and I keep this part here 2k plus 1 and I get 6 times k plus 1 at the final parts here and everything is of course still 
Det var ikke. Nei, fix. And you see, at the next step now, I do something very straightforward. I just calculate here. I multiply into the parentheses. Uh, k times 2k is 2k squared, isn't it? That produces this one. And then I get k times 1 from here, which is 1k. And I get 6 times k there, which is 6k. 6 plus 1 is 7k. So then I get the 7k there. And of course, I still have this. 6 times 1 here, which remains a 6. So I can end up with this part times this part. So what I have done in this equation is to make the assumption that the formula works for n equals to k. And, on a, and by using that assumption, I kind of derived an expression which should work for k plus 1. So what I need to show now is that by just entering k plus 1 into the original formula, if I get the same answer as here, then it's OK. And that's exactly what I'm doing at the next step here. <coughs> Finally, as it says here, we insert k plus 1 into the formula and compare it with the equation 5. And if these two expressions are equal, then we have showed what we wanted to show. And this is straightforward. Uh, you see this expression here comes from taking the original formula here and submit k plus 1 instead of k here. If I do that, I end up with the expression on the next page. I have k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 divided by 6. And I should enter k plus 1 in here now. Okay, k plus 1 is put in instead OK. Then I get k plus 1 in front. And I have k plus 1 here. And so, so it's for instead of the k, it's k plus 1, which means k plus 2 as a total, doesn't it? k plus 2 from that one. And finally, I get 2 times k plus 1 plus 1 there, divided by 6. So you see, I, I, I have this k plus 1 divided by 6 expression in the front which corresponds here. So if the rest here is the same as that one, or the one which I took out, then it's OK. So you see this here. <coughs> we need to look at the next page, don't we? Here it is. You see on the top here, I can take that outside, and I have k plus 2 times 2k plus 3. Can we see that we get that? 2k plus 2. 2 plus 1 is 3, so it's 2k plus 3. So I get k plus 2 times 2k plus 3. And then I just calculate by taking multiplications in here, and it turns out that I end up with the same expression. So this works, OK? This formula is correct. <laughs> Any questions? So you, know, you, you kind of need to know how to do this, okay? If you just try it, you, you, you get nowhere, basically. But there was an example in the, in the text, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I thought maybe that could aid you in kind of do this. Maybe it wasn't that easy. Of course, you will not be tested in this on the exam, if you're afraid of that. This is really no part of the logistics. This is just math. But the idea was just to kind of start at some point, having some exercise, doing some algebra, working with fractions, working with parentheses, doing multiplications, all this stuff we kind of need as we move along. So, so, um, so it, 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 it kind of meant, gave sense in this, in this case. OK, this was the first one. Then we move to the kind of main part of this exercise, which is related to the stuff we learned or should have learned in chapter 2 on forecasting. It says here in the text that uh, the figure, uh, it should perhaps be, yeah, yeah. the figure above, it should perhaps uh, shows sales figures in the first full sales year for the N Nintendo GameCube. 
introduced on the US market in November 2001. So this is actually from the starting point of the Nintendo GameCube. So that may be the reason why you didn't sell so much in the Christmas period of 2001, as we briefly discussed when we look at this. And then we see that these uh, sales figures, they kind of change a little bit, move a little up, but it seems to have to, to reach some kind of top at around Christmas uh, by the end of uh, these two. No, sorry. I pre made you. I, I don't see so good anymore. I need to look at the screen. Yeah. You see, we get the top here around around Christmas, which is yeah. The second of December is immediately before Christmas in a sense, so you would expect some some increased sales there. But in in sub question B, we are kind of given a, an exp explicit uh, a command here on what to do. It says use a simple linear regression model estimate parameters A and B, and use the model to predict future sales values up to and including 2005. So what I'm asking you to do here is to use the data here and, and perform a linear regression, which means put some kind of straight line into this data. It should perhaps go something like up here, this one would, would weigh something, and this one, so you would expect it to go somewhere in between, but but increase upwards wh when you do that. And you should use it to, to, to make forecasts for what will happen the years after. I if we look back on the, uh, as it says here, uh, data for this case is available in, in an Excel format uh, on the fronter. And the data which should be used in the estimation are those in the figure that is only from the year 2002, which means, of course, that there are data for, for more periods than the one we plotted here. So if you look at uh, and this Excel file on exercise one, you will see here that uh, there is much more data than actually what was plotted in the figure here. You see here that this part is plotted, the only part here, uh, moving up here, which, which you saw in the text. So there's a whole pile of, of other numbers here saying what happened with the sale of this GameCube device after uh, uh, the year 2002. So now there are two options. Either we can do this manually on a paper by putting the numbers into the formulas, or we can, as I showed you last time, use Excel directly here. That would be very easy to do when you have access to the Excel, Excel file. You can just take these values here. You could copy it. You could put it, let's say, up here. And you can put in just some numbers here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, there are 12 months, and then we can make this graph out of these numbers. We have to use this x, y graph, as you recall, to construct the regression model. So if you go to insert here and pick this scatter plot, then uh, we get the plot here, which of course is the same as this one. And then you just click on them, you right click, and you add a trend line. Okay, it should be linear. By, uh, by given in the, in the text, we can uh, display the equation, maybe we should even dis display R square, and then we, we have solved the problem. Okay, this was the easy way out. Straightforward. And you also see the line in the data. You now, of course, if you want to really do this, you should, in a sense, make this line longer. Okay, you should, if you want to predict after this 12 period, no, you just keep on drawing this line and that will produce your forecasts. Of course, you, you know by the data you already have seen that it doesn't work like this because it, it goes down again and up again as you move along. So this is a very bad prediction, by the way. Then. Okay, that, that was kind of a part of the point here. You see the R square here is 0 0.59. So it doesn't really capture the data very nicely. You can see that. Uh, you see there's a lot of data on each side of the line. So uh, using a straight line here is perhaps not uh, the best way to represent these data. If you look at the solution text, you'll see that uh, it's, it's clearly, yeah, maybe we should look at the solution text a little bit before I move to that, okay? You see, in the solution text, I did this manually. 
I actually enter data into the formulas. And then I use these formulas of the textbook, which was kind of the root for this induction proof, which was kind of a special case of the general formulas. So I just uh, computed this S x y, which is n times the sum of i times di minus n times n plus 1 halves times the sum of the di's. And of course, to be able to do this, I need to compute a little bit of stuff here, don't I? I need to compute the sum of the di's. I, I have to add all these numbers together. That is done down here in equation 11. And I also need this sum, so I need to take and mul to multiply each time period with each demand number. So I should take 1 times that one plus 2 times that one and so on to produce this sum, which is done in equation 10. Then I get these two numbers, 20,466.598 and 2,000, or maybe it's millions, yeah, uh, millions per, perhaps, yeah, yeah, 20 million, 466 and so on, okay. And then I have what I need to compute this S X Y and S X X. The X S X Y is then simply computed directly down here by taking N. Sorry about this. Ah. Uh, maybe I should point at the screen here. <coughs> so I first concentrate on this equation here to produce this X S X Y. Okay. Now I computed this sum. I computed that sum. And I have to take n, which is 12 times that number, 12 times this number, which is in from equation 10, and then I have to take and subtract n, which is 12 times n plus 1, which is then 13, 12 times 13 halves, times the other number. That produces 62.628.186. This is the so-called SXY. Then I need SX, SXX, and when I have those two, I can just compute this unknown b, which I'm looking for, and this a later on. That's the idea. So you see, I just take these numbers now. I take this <coughs> SXX, which of course is constructed by the formula above by taking these new numbers. Maybe you should do, look at it, okay? Oh, we have to go here to see this. To compute this SXX, I need to use equation 8, and n squared is 12 squared, n plus 1 is 13. 2 times n is 2 times 12, which is 24 plus 1, which is 25. n squared is still 12 squared, and n plus 1 is 13, 13 squared. So this expression is just entering n equals to 12 into equation 8. Of course, this is computable, you just use, need some kind of calculator or something to compute it, and then you get 1716. So then I'm in a position where I can compute this b directly because I have the s x y, which is this number. I have the s x x, which is this number. I can just divide them by each other to produce this b. This is done on the next screen here, as you can see here. Exactly what I do, and I get something around 36,496 point something. And this A then is computed from the remaining formula up here. Ah, where did it? Where was it? It was down here, wasn't it? Yeah. Didn't I write that formula? Yeah, it's here. I take the average of the D's, I am together, divided by 12. So I take this sum and divide by 12 to get this D bar. Then I have to subtract the B I found on the previous page, times tw 13 divided by 2 to get this b. And that produced, in this case, uh, these numbers of uh, 36, 4966 6, and minus 41746. <coughs> Which is lower. This a here is actually a crossing with this line. So you see the line here kind of goes under the side. So you, you should expect a negative number here. And this one should be positive, it kind of measures the, the angle here. So if it's positive, it goes like this. If it's negative, it goes like this, as you probably remember from the, from the microeconomics course. <coughs> Moving on then, I say the best way to compare the prediction model with the data for the given period is perhaps by visual inspection. So 
Then typically what we do is that we draw our model together with the original data to see how it works, how it kind of fits the data. And as you can see here, it doesn't really fit very well. And our R square of around 0 0.5 or something indicates that it kind of doesn't hit the data perfectly. But of course, you must not forget that the idea here is not necessarily to kind of put a model that kind of fits the data perfectly, especially if you have a feeling that the behavior you see here is something which does not lead to a kind of kept sales increase in the future. And if you have an idea that these type of products could have some seasonal behavior, then it's very risky to use these kind of methods, obviously, because then you would overestimate your future sales, you would produce too many game cubes, they would be stuck in a lot of inventory rooms around, that is not a good idea. So, and then I start talking, okay, if we would like, of course, we can kind of use a more accurate formula to fit to the data. You see an example down here, where I have uh, used a polynomial of the order 6. So you see, by kind of moving from a linear model here into a non-linear model, of course we can get patterns to the data that fits our data much more nicely. And indeed, we are actually certain that we can fit it perfectly, if you like, if it, as long as the order of the polynomial is the size of our observations. In that case, we are able to be certain that all numbers here are kind of fit into some kind of smooth function. But again, that is not the point, is it? I don't know how these functions behave. Maybe it goes something like this. Maybe it goes something like this. That wouldn't help us much, would it? Because it doesn't tell anything about a reasonable behavior of these products as we look after 2002. And of course, in this case, we even have the, the answer because we know what's happening after 2002 because we have all the data. So that moves us to the final question in the exercise, which was not there, by the way, maybe it was here then. Ah. 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 There it is. So in C, I haven't actually done this. Of course, you can just make the line bigger, and if you do that and compare with the data, you kind of miss it completely. Because the data is kind of restricted here. What's happening is, of course, that this pattern we see here, moving relatively steady here, going up towards Christmas, kind of keeps on repeating itself as we move on on the data. And if we kind of use a straight line here, we miss everything about this. So uh, <coughs> that was the idea of this question C. Well, you do this formula putting in numbers, isn't really the big point. You can just kind of think about it. <coughs> and then indeed, do you have any suggestions for improvement on the model? Well, we have a model, we have a linear regression model, we have this straight line, and we have kind of argue that this is a very bad model, so maybe we should do something else. And we learned about seasonality, didn't we, in the course? So the idea now, of course, should be to look at the seasonal model, where we just compute seasonal factors and see how that could improve our model. So let's look at uh, the solution here again. It says here, if we think a little bit about what kind of product the Nintendo GameCube are, or maybe it should be is, yeah, sorry about English here, it seems reasonable to expect seasonal variations. As we said, we discussed this before, haven't we? These kind of products, they sell more at Christmas, maybe at Easter, maybe at summer holidays, so there should be some kind of repeating patterns. Possibly with kind of maybe some underlying trend, if it kind of becomes very popular, then you can, but you, you still see this pattern. You, you, this is a a full screen of all the data which is available, and you see here that this pattern is repeated. It probably had a top year here, in kind of year two of its, of its life cycle, and it seems to go down. And you probably all know that in 2006 the, the actual Wii was introduced, so this was the kind of, you should expect it to go down here. It was a heavy competition with PlayStation 2 and kind of stuff here. <coughs> Yeah, it says here, game consoles are most probably sold more during Christmas time than most other time periods of the year. The data for 2002 indicates this as well as the rest of the data, if we consider them as shown in the figure below this one. Surely, if we take all the data into account, that is, if we want to make predictions for the time period after 2005, a different approach is reasonable. It is, for instance, readily observable that a strong positive trend, not necessarily so well. We don't see kind of any kind of 
either increasing or going down here. So it doesn't seem like a bad idea to just stick with a very simple seasonal approach here, just compute these seasonal factors and use them to predict. And that's basically what is done here in the solution. However, in this solution we stick with the basic assumption that the only data available are those from 2002. Still, it seems reasonable to use some kind of seasonal adjustments, and that's basically what we do. Uh, let us follow the description in the textbook, which calls for computation of seasonal indexes or seasonal factors by this formula. You construct a seasonal factor by taking the individual demand observations and divide by the average. That is, we divide each of the observations of 2002 on the average demand. Then to construct predictions, for instance for the next year, we simply take the average for of the data for 2002 and multiply each of the observations by the seasonal factors. I use the te term index here, as you can see, SI. The intelligent reader will hopefully realize that this is simply that this simply implies using the exact data for last year as prediction for the next year. This is easily seen. If you look at this formula here, our forecast is constructed by taking the average of the D and multiply by SI. If you recall the example we looked at in the lecture here, it was a bit more complex, wasn't it? Because then we had kind of four different seasonal factors and we produced an average on those. In this case, there's only one season we have observations for. Only the 2002 season. So, in, so, so it ends up much easier. We take the average of the, the demand data available, which is from January including December, and multiply with this seasonal factor. The seasonal factor is constructed like this, and of course if you put it in you see that this one can be reduced and you end by a forecast exactly equal to the original data. Do you see what this means? I just take my data and ju just use them for all future periods. The reason why this was different in the example we looked at was the fact that we had more than one season observed. And if we were given the question here on, on making predictions for 2006, then it would change, wouldn't it? Because then we could produce one seasonal factor for January here, another for January there, a third there, and that those three numbers would have to be averaged, which produce different than the actual data. But in this case, when we only have one season, all forecasts after that season will be exactly the same as the first data. So it's very easy to, to make predictions here. It's just copying the original data for the next year and for the year after and so on. And you can see what's happening here if you look at it. The pink line here is this original data, which then are the seasonal indices, which produces these forecasts. So it's just a, com a perfect rep replica of the first period here, which is put into this period here and this, that period there and the final period there. And then you can start comparing what, with what actually did happen. What is something outside? Okay. You see, in, in the second year here, of course, we miss a lot on the top here. On the other hand, luckily, we are kind of underestimating. So we come in a situation where we, where we produce less than, than the demand, which is probably better than the, the other side around. But then you see it starts kind of fitting very nicely here, and if you look at the patterns in between, it's not very bad actually. So uh, a very simple approach like this may, <coughs> may, may, may actually work very good, as it did in this si situation. Using a linear regression would, on the other hand, produce forecasts like this, okay? Huge overestimating in the, in the last periods. So that is not a good idea. So the, I, the point of this exercise was to train you in both doing this, either on the computer or on paper or using calculator or whatever you like, and then also try to put some sense into it. Okay? Try to think about what are you actually forecasting, and you cannot kind of do it straightforwardly, automatically, without thinking. That was the basic idea. So, do you have any questions? Was this clear now? Yeah. We will do more and more advanced and more interesting regression in the second part of the course. Then we will really need to look into it. OK.
Okay, this was exercise one. As I said last time, we are kind of uh, finished uh, the parts which are needed for exercise two, so we just keep on and uh, next Monday I will go through exercise two. So let's just have a quick look on exercise two before the break. Exercise two is here. So let's look briefly at it. It says here in chapter three of the textbook, three different solutions to the same example aggregate planning model. Uh, explicitly formulated in paragraph 3.6 at pages 147 to 148 are presented. I'm not really sure whether these pages are the same. You know these textbooks they have a tendency to kind of evolve, so I don't know whether it's in page 147. Let's see. Ah, it is. Yeah, it is. 147 or 148. So that was correct. So you remember we discussed this model. There were two kind of extreme ways to look at it. Uh, 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 I use a different term here than, uh, or at least uh, I, I, I call it the chase demand plan, plan two here. I use the term zero inventory or minimal inventory plan. So this means the same. Okay, so either you chase the demand, meaning you produce demand as it comes. Uh, of course, the consequence is that you keep nothing on inventory. The, the, the other extreme was a, a constant work first solution. And you see there are kind of page references to these solutions in the, in the textbook. And the first solution we also did, we kind of used Lingo to find the optimal solution. So the idea here now is to kind of look at this model, try to kind of use the Lingo to do stuff. See what happens when you do various stuff. As you know that we want to judge the effect of changing various costs. If you recall this model we looked at, it was kind of three cost elements. It was a hiring cost, a firing cost, and an inventory cost. And in these I, double I, and triple I cases here, I want you to look at what happens if certain of these costs are much larger than the other costs. Of course, the easy way to do that in, in Lingo is just to put numbers in. So if you want, are asked for to put in a very high cost of it, you put that very high and you put the other costs very low and see what happens. Okay. Uh, so that is kind of the, the main part in A here. In B, you are kind of asked to try to <coughs> identify practical situations which represents these cases, which are maybe a bit harder. But you have to think about the meaning here. What does it mean that, for instance, as in point three here, the inventory cost is large? Then you need to think about what is inventory cost? What makes inventory cost very large compared to other costs? What kind of situation is that? The same with these higher and higher, when, when are hiring costs large? When are firing costs large? We, we know that perhaps that in Norway that firing costs are large, don't we? we in very high developed societies, yeah, you, you, can, you can get the, uh, I shouldn't solve the exercise for you. You should think a little bit about this. Then in C, you should, you should use Lingo explic explicitly, it says here, and simulate these situations, one, two, and three, and discuss your actual results. Do they seem reasonable? So the idea then is just to, to make in I make CH very large and the other small and just run and see what happens. And try, try to compare the different solutions and see if you can find any structural differences. You would perhaps expect to do that if you have very high inventory costs, then you wouldn't do a lot of inventory, would you? So then you will get a kind of zero inventory solution. You would expect that, don't you think so? Yeah. I shouldn't help you more, I think. Yeah, this is straightforward, okay. Now it says in the as you know that the storage space is limited to storing 500 units in any period. So now we kind of put an added constraint in the model here. And of course what you need to do to solve this is to kind of convert this information into a mathematical equation, put it alongside the rest of the model into Lingo and solve again. It says it does this information change the linear programming solution, which is of course the solution, the, the, the solution capital I up there, where you kind of find the optimal solution. Uh, I, I think I will leave this for you. Okay, what happens to the optimal if the uh, load maximum storage amount is reduced to 100 units? It may seem here, but I don't remember that this 500 is too high to kind of have any effect. 
That seems to be kind of the, the expected answer here. But uh, if you reduce this to 100, then maybe it has an effect. This is relatively easy to understand, isn't it? If you look at the solution to the linear program and look at the i variables, if all i variables are less than 500, then make putting that constraint wouldn't change anything, right? because then the optimal solution doesn't involve spending so, so big inventory amounts. But maybe there are somebody on the around 100 then, or, or a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, over 100, 200 or something. In that case, putting these constraints of 100 would change the stuff. Then finally assume that the storage capacity is 100 units at the maximum and that you're given the option of increasing it to 500 units. How much would you maximally pay for this option? That should be possible to derive if you understand what this is about. The simple solution, oh, I shouldn't say this. We stop there. You, can, you should think about this yourself. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. I shouldn't help you too much. I'm, I'm far too kind. Okay, should we take a break? Yeah. yeah. Then we move on uh, with the rest of the new stuff. Did you manage to check the keyboard? Uh, no, I no. don't have any internet. You don't have internet? I think this guest thing is destroyed. Yeah, it used to work, but it doesn't work anymore. No, it doesn't work. I don't know why, but silly. I told you how to the court is Can't connect with my mobile phone either. So, so then I use this start.handle.handle. Uh, then I connect it. Yeah. 
First there was one and uh, warning. Yeah. Terminate and this. Then I said no. Then it's connected. How did you connect? Here? No. Yeah. Just use your user username, try on yours. And uh, activate with the username. What do you call it? Activate. Activate? At the rate. At the rate? At the rate. At. Oh. Okay. What you said? We just say at. Okay. That's kind of the A with the circle around. Yeah. Yeah. At. Yeah. No, with the screen. Oh, here. Start at Have you brought the book? S-T-U-D. Start. Don't hide on it. Oh, oh no. And your password. I don't know, I was stuck like for two months. You were? <laughs> yeah, I was using like a wire from the oh. office and using it and <laughs> suddenly... <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking of buying this book. Mm -hmm. But look at the price. Yeah, six hundred. Seven hundred. Six nine nine. Yeah, six. Yeah. Six is nine. Yeah. But uh, wow. <laughs> Is the camera turned on? No way. Is it recording? No, I don't think so. Are you sure? It's a red light then. It's recording. It's recording. <laughs> Should we stop? Maybe forget to start. Maybe forget to start. Yes. I don't see any different <laughs> things. I don't know. Yeah. Let's just leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Pretend for safety, more. security reasons.
Is the camera on? It seems so. So if you've said anything now, you will. Uh, <laughs> you, have. you have. Okay. Have you talked about me? <laughs> That's good. Uh, we, will, we will take it out. Okay. I, th I forgot to take it off, I think. Okay, then it will be a very long first hour. I saw this MFK player in the horse. Uh, I, it seems to be. It's Ulrik Flo, was it? Per Egil Flo. Per Egil Flo, yeah. Yeah, maybe his brother. No, I think it's their cousins, actually. Oh, okay. yeah. So there are some uh, Molde players pr possibly being students here now, it seems. Yeah, a few of those. Yeah, I, Martin Linnes, I think. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen him. No, me neither. Maybe not sitting at home watching the videos. Yeah, 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 perhaps. Why not? Okay, do you have any have you come up with any interesting questions in the break? You can ask me? No, no you haven't. No. Okay, that's good. Then we can move on. Yeah, it says here uh, now we have done parts one and two here, so we know we are kind of moving back into the theoretical stuff and uh, I promised you a quick uh, repeat of this. EOQ model again. So let me just take out the board here. Okay. The EOQ model. This is uh, perhaps the oldest model in logistics as such. I think it's from the 20s. It, it's kind of a very useful model. It can be used in many cases, at least two very different cases, which we will talk about today. Okay. So in its original form, it's kind of related to, to purchasing. You know what purchasing is? Yeah. yeah, you buy something. And of course, in events, this is something you will have to do. In many cases, you can buy artists, you can buy contracts, you can buy food, you can buy beverages. All this kind of purchasing is, is in many cases, uh, both necessary as well as desirable. So we look at the kind of um, micro type of problem here. So uh, we can look at the following. How much should be ordered, if you like, bought uh, of a single item. So again, we look at a, a single item here. And in many cases, we can do that item by item. In other cases, we can't. We will uh, look more into this. Uh, given and this is perhaps the most important part, given the terministic and the real major part, constant demand. If you remember our previous example of this Nintendo GameCube, we one thing which was fairly obvious there was that the demand was not constant. Okay, this kind of changes over time. So, uh, so this is obviously as this is obviously a big approximation. In most real-world cases, we very seldom have constant demand. It could be contractual situations where you kind of negotiate a kind of fixed thing to deliver. I should deliver this and this and so much and so on. But uh, in most cases, uh, this is not how it is. But even though you can have variable demand, you can still in many cases use this one, either as a direct approximation or use it as a building block for more complex ways of solving the problem. So it is, it is useful in many cases. We will see it as we move along. We have some structural assumptions on this problem. We assume 
a cost structure which contains a capital K which we refer to as the order cost and this cost is a fixed cost which kind of doesn't link up to how much we buy it just kind of ref reflects the actual purchasing process okay I have to do some administration I have to look into some computer programs I have to maybe put out a tender you know what a tender is in which it's unbid you know it when you you may have to kind of there are certain laws you know in Norway that if you to buy a lot in, in the public sector you kind of have to put out the tender of course constructing a tender doesn't come by itself okay <laughs> you have to write some documents you have to specify and all these kind of stuff so th there's a lot of work involved administratively in purchasing and placing orders and this is kind of the basic content of this part of the cost of this problem the more classical one small c is the actual buying price if you like We think of this as a unit price, how much we pay for each unit we actually acquire. And then finally, our H, which is the inventory cost. Do you know why we use the um, letter H for it? The reason is that we in many of our models, you saw one in the aggregation and production planning, that we use I for inventory as the variable name. And then we need another name for the cost component. And uh, this is often referred to as holding cost as well. As well. That is the reason for the H. Holding cost. These are the costs. So these are kind of constants in our problem. They are kind of given uh, either as letters or as numbers. And we also need to have uh, our demand here. So demand is given. It was assumed deterministic and constant. So we know it perfectly in the future. And it doesn't change in the future. That's the meaning of this. So demand, we use the term lambda for demand here. This is the Greek letter. It's written like this. Have you seen it before? This was not nice. Let me draw it once more. Ah. ah, something like that. Okay. So this is the units demanded per some kind of unit time. Okay, so we, we can think of this as a kind of demand intensity. How much per year, per month. The, the time structure here will kind of change depending on what situation we look at. So these are constants and we have a variable and of course the variable is how much we should buy how many units of the product we tend to use the letter capital Q on that one it's the number of units ordered and bought if you like okay now we can kind of make a graphical image of this situation we can't be if we kind of start here we need to order some goods and in many practical cases, it takes a certain amount of time from the point you order until the time you get. We have a name on that in logistics, we call that lead time. Okay? And lead times are kind of available in many situations, not only in purchasing, but also for instance in production. But uh, in the simplest version of this model, we kind of assume that there is no lead time. So when I order capital Q, I get capital Q immediately. It comes, it flows into my storage with a snap and of course then demand starts and demand is constant which means that if you draw this on the line here demanding, uh, depending on the size of demand you can get something like this then you have a big demand 
or you can have something like this. Then you have slower demand. Can you see that? Then it kind of decays slower. But as long as it's constant, it should be a straight line here with the same kind of, of, uh, of curvature on the, on the straight line. <laughs> Would it be any point here in having, in this kind of situation, in having something like this, where you have a Q1 here and a Q2 here, and where Q1 is not equal to Q2? Would that be a point? So these Qs, they kind of represent our optimal or cheapest schedule. And if we now think, and we have to kind of add basically to this assumption here, that's that this is a kind of model which has an infinite horizon. So we kind of have a very long kind of future ahead here. And given that assumption, combined with a constant demand, with no uncertainty, it should be fairly obvious, at least in my mind, that there is no point here in kind of doing different things when you move from one period to the other. There is, there is either a single optimal solution here or there is none, in a sense. So, so we can kind of assume here, already from the start, that we just look for a single Q. We don't have to look for more than one Q. Okay? That's the point here. There is only one optimal order quantity here, given these assumptions. But of course, if you open up for uncertainty here, or time varying demand and so on, then that will change, which we will see as we move on. Okay. So this is kind of a consequence of the assumption underlying this simple IOQ model. And we, we kind of can stick to a single variable here, which in a sense then is correct given the assumptions. Okay. Now the typical structure in formulating a logistics model is to, to start thinking about the objective first. And uh, in almost all cases, we stick to a cost minimizing objective, which is typically the case here. We, we have some cost elements. We would like to do these as efficient as possible, spending as little resources as we can. And uh, the consequence of that would be to minimize the total costs here. So we need to kind of get a, an expression for total costs. And that expression we can then attack, hopefully with some mathematical methods, to, to find an expression for the optimal order quant quantity as a function of these constants here. So let's look at uh, our total cost. Now we know we have, at, we have introduced a certain capital K, which is the cost per order. So some order costs are here, obviously. There are some order costs. And we have to buy the product. It has the price. OK, so there is some, per, some should we say, say, buying costs. And there should be some inventory or holding costs. So we need to kind of uh, specify these three elements to, uh, to construct our total cost formula, which we then can optimize. These capital K produced cost per order. So in order to compute it, we need to say something about how many orders do we place, obviously. And then we just multiply these number of orders with this cost per order to produce the total order cost. Now, if uh, lambda is 100, meaning that uh, our customers will buy 100 in a certain time period ahead now. Okay. And if we order 20, how many orders do we have to make then? Five, yes. Can we compute this five? It's easy, isn't it? We just take 100 and divide by 20, which is lambda over Q. So lambda over Q is the number of orders. So, and I use this term to, to mean numbers, number of orders, equals lambda over Q. Okay. So what is the cost of a single order? Should 
represent total cost of a single order because then we have to pay the ordering cost but we also have to buy the product itself don't we? so a single order would lead to the order cost for the single order plus the buying price times the number we buy you agree these must be the total the combined order and buying costs so this term covers these two elements agree I have to place my order I have to do that administrative part given that I have decided how much to buy and then I can buy the actual product so this is just kind of product price if you like times the number of units ordered so this is the cost of a single order now we place lambda divided by capital Q orders don't we so the total combined order and buying cost is lambda over Q times the cost of a single order K plus C times Q Course, if you multiply this lambda divided by q into these parentheses, we end up with the following expression. And we can reduce the q here. And we end up on the top here. order plus by cost should then equal lambda over q times k plus c times lambda okay following directly from this one okay then the only thing which is missing here is the inventory cost okay in order to compute the inventory cost we have to say something about how much we have in our inventory and we have this pattern here don't we it kind of moves like this moves like this so obviously within a period we don't have a fixed number in inventory you can see that it changes obviously so unless you want to do it very complicated it could perhaps be a good idea to look at the average inventory over such a period and multiply that with the order cost to produce the total order costs. So what is the average inventory if we have a profile like this? If this is Q, then we can have an inventory which goes like this. Big demand goes like this. Small demand, okay? And it goes slow. So we need to kind of find a point here which produces the average inventory. Do you know what it is? It turns out very simply to be Q halves. So half of this Q is what we have on inventory on average. Uh, it is not necessarily straightforward to show that. So I think I'll just give you some examples here, okay? Instead of going through this math, which is kind of a most guys who, who teach this doesn't talk about this at all. They say, okay, half of the Q is the average inventory, and then no student dares to ask, which is... But if you look, uh, let's look at some numbers here, okay? Suppose we have this demand, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, this is an example of a fairly slow demand, okay? Uh, let's look at the same speed, but a smaller Q, 5, four three two one zero okay same speed the speed is kind of the difference between the numbers the derivative if you like okay uh, we can look at the foster this is situation one to look at the foster situation in that case 
if you look at uh, the same queue here, it could be something like this, for instance. These are obviously a faster, a bigger demand. Okay, this is kind of half the demand of this one. You see that? Do the same here, if you like. Maybe a different number, a third queue. Let's look at six, four, two, zero. Okay, so we we have some different speeds and some different queues. And if you didn't know the answer, you, you, maybe you would have a feeling that it may be that the model number itself should be a part of the average demand. But it turns out not to be. Okay, and it's straight easy to see that now. If you just compute the average here, add these numbers together, divide by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Then you get 55 divided by 11, which is 5, which of course is half the Q here. If you do the same here, you get 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, don't you? Here is 15. And it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 15 divided by 6. How much is that? That is 2.5, which is exactly half of 5. If you add these together, 18, uh, sorry, 10, 28, 30, isn't it? This is 30. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 30 over 6 is 5, which of course is half of 10. So you see, no matter how you twist and turn this, use or actually the demand speed, it kind of doesn't matter. So the average inventory is not related to demand itself. It's only related to how much you buy. And that simplifies our problem a lot. So inventory cost is H times Q halves. Okay, we have this expression and this expression we just Combine them and then look for the optimal solution. That is how it works. So this produces a total cost. We can call that TC, for instance, meaning total cost. Our total cost is a function of one variable Q, the capital Q here. Okay? This is a constant, this is a constant, this is a constant. So we end up here with our order cost. And then I skip this part for now. And I add my inventory cost and then I add this part in the end here. The reason for that is that these is not a function of Q, so this is a constant, isn't it? It doesn't vary when Q varies. And if you think about optimization here, suppose I want to find the maximum of this function here. That is this point, which produces a value on the x-axis here. This is my optimal solution, the, one, the, the value I'm looking for. If I add a constant to this function, plus some kind of constant, the only thing happening here is that I cannot either move it or take it down. Okay? So it, kind of, it could be suddenly something like this, okay? by adding these constant. Of course, the value on top changes here, but the value on bottom doesn't change. So I didn't, don't need to take into consideration these constants when I perform optimization. I can just remove them, but of course, if I'm interested in finding my total cost, I have to add them in the end. You see my point? It could be situations here when this part is a function of Q. Can you think about such situations? In some situations, when you go at the supermarket to buy something, it could be certain offers which are such that if you buy above a certain amount, then the price is cheaper. Have you been into those situations? This means that the C here is a function of how much you buy, isn't it? In that case, you see, then you have to put that into this equation and that would produce a different, more complex formula typically. So all kind of discounts can be treated in this model given that you're able to formulate this discount function. Relatively straightforward. 
course it com becomes more complex. Now given this, then we of course can remove this part. It's not necessary to perform the optimization. We just take the derivative here, equate that to zero. Taking the derivative here is straightforward. This is minus lambda times k over q to the power of 2. Do you remember this formula? You want to take the derivative of a fraction. Then you have to take the derivative of this one times that one minus that one times the derivative of that one. So this is a u, this is a v, this is a u, and divide by u squared. This is the formula that produces this derivative. Okay? I take the derivative of the denominator here, which is a constant, which is zero. And then I should multiply it with q. That is zero. And then I have to put a minus, and then I take my constant and multiply it with the derivative of q, which is one. So my constant is left, and then I have to divide by the square of the variable, which is q squared. So that is the reason why I get this derivative here. I have to know this formula here. Alternatively, if I don't, I can... Uh, okay, let's skip it. In this case, it, it's, it's actually possible to use, use this one. You remember this one? It's possible to use it here if you know that this can be written as q to the minus 2 power. In that case, you can use this formula to produce the same result. Okay, this was uh, perhaps not very clear. There should be a minus here. Then I take the derivative of that one, and then of course I get the derivative of that one, which is 8h halves, and this should equal 0. Now I can just solve this equation to find the q, and it turns out after a little bit of algebra here, which you can look at yourself, that our final answer is that q, and then I tend to use a star here to denote that I have solved this equation equals the square root of 2 lambda k over h. So this is the standard E of q formula. I have to be careful not to sit outside the camera reach. Then it becomes uh, boring for a watcher, don't you think so? Or maybe even better. Who knows? Okay, any questions? You should have seen this before. Yeah. And you have. Did you see it in the same fashion? Maybe the, the traditional way is perhaps not to include this part. Which is silly in a sense because it opens up for kind of extending this model very easily into discounts, which is of course is in practical logistics discounts are important, okay? If you can kind of come over a certain step to get a cheaper price, then you typically would that do that if it kind of fits with the rest of what you do. So you have to keep keep these discounts both clear and available. Okay, now our next project is to interpret this model in a different setting. Okay. So instead of thinking about this in a purchasing setting, we now move into a production setting, but then we have to interpret the model slightly different. So, what could we call that? We could call it EOQ in production. And the reason not, why is that I kind of want to move on with more production planning, basically. That's the idea by kind of going back into this EOQ part. Now, this lambda here is the same. But remember now, we are kind of thinking about the production setting. So something is to be transformed from raw material and capital and whatever into products. But still a single product, so that's as before. 
still a single product. We assume now in our production setting, just as we did in the, in the purchasing setting, that uh, production takes no time. So when we start to produce, it immediately becomes finished. So there's no time lag between starting to produce and production. So we refer to that as, as instantaneous production. So basically this is not changed from before, but of course when we look at production we kind of have to think differently on what lead time means. What is typical when you purchase stuff is that you place an order and then after some time the order comes. When you produce, it may be that you build, you build things up gradually. So you can kind of produce at the same time as you take out of inventory. So there is possibilities to kind of extend this EOQ into a more, should we say, production-like setting. We will not do that here. That would, would add some complexities. So what about this K? This was the order cost. Of course, we don't order production, do we? We can order it, but uh, we can decide ourselves. Uh, so, the counterpart to the order cost, which we had in purchasing, in production, is what we refer to as setup. Do you know what setup is? If you don't, I will have to tell you. In most cases, when you produce, there is some machines involved, okay? And when you stop your production for a period, then you typically turn off your machine. In many cases, starting a machine involves some additional costs. Maybe you need some experts to do some maintenance, and have to, okay? Uh, but probably more typical is that you will have to do some maintenance or some washing. A lot of food type of products, which kind of use the same machine, needs that you wash the machine before you move into another product. Or if you stop your production on Friday, start again on Monday, you will have to kind of do some, some kind of stuff to make the machinery work. We refer to this as setup. And setup in practice will involve two dimensions. It takes a certain amount of time. We refer to that as setup time, but there would also be some costs. In many cases, we will model these two mechanisms simultaneously. In other cases, we will do it one by one or both uh, in, in different dimensions. But in this setting, it, it's perhaps easiest to think of setup as costs only. So there are some costs here which kind of takes place each time you start to produce. So you have to bear that cost, which is referred to as a setup cost, but when you have made the decision to start producing, then immediately your product is finished. Okay? So if I decide I want to produce 100,000 units, then suddenly I have 100,000 units after making my decision on, uh, on taking this set of costs. That, that's kind of the interpretation here. So we have set up, and of course we have a set up cost, which kind of plays the role of the order cost. Of course, if you like, we can kind of do the same interpretation on the buying here as buying raw materials. So if we need some raw materials, then we could, but still it would be a constant related to the, to the capital Q, so we just omit that here. But the point then is basically that, uh, that um, that both production and purchasing can be seen in the same kind of pattern. Of course, still given our strong assumptions of a deterministic and constant demand structure. But, uh, but there are also other strong assumptions here about this, this stuff being instantaneous. Okay, so you, you just start to produce and suddenly you have it. It doesn't take any time. Same in the purchasing case. 
Of course, then it means that our basic EOQ formula, which we wrote on the board in the previous hour, can be used in production as well, as long as we do the kind of interpretation as we do here. And be aware of the limitations of the models. Okay, okay. So, what we will do now is that we will move one step ahead. So, now we will remove the assumption of a constant demand and allow a time varying demand, which is kind of much closer to what we have seen. Remember this Nintendo GameCubes, they kind of changed in time. So, we it could be a good idea perhaps to have models which can handle situations where we are able to forecast a time varying demand. And of course, if we produce most products, uh, there are certain seasonal patterns at last which could produce forecasts which are not the same for all possible future months. Mm -hmm. I just need some more of this. So. Now, we abolish, you know what that means, the lambda equals constant assumption, if you like, this was original assumption, but now suddenly this lambda can be a function of t. Okay. And the kind of models in logistics which kind of deal with this situation are often referred to as lot size oh, models. No. An enormous amount of different models here, we will just look at one, I think. And to keep you in track in the textbook, now we move to Chapter 7.2 in the textbook. Just make a big leap here to kind of reach to this these stuff. Okay. Any questions? And this is of course one reason why this EOQ formula has been so immensely popular in logistics is that kind of a wide range of application areas. It kind of covers the two perhaps most important parts of logistics, purchasing and production. It does, however, not play a major part in transportation, if you thought about that. But it does not. <coughs> Okay, let us look at an example like this now, okay, so we have, uh, we have some forecasts now for some, some kind of product, uh, it doesn't really matter how much, how, what kind of product it is, so let me just write down some numbers for you here. So here there is some forecasts for some product. Uh, you could say we, I think that the timing of the textbook kind of is that we are now in period 3, so there is a forecast of 42 for period 4, and there is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, so it's a kind of 9 period look ahead here. 42, 42, 32, 12, 26. 112, a very big change there, 45, 14, 76, 38. You can find these same numbers in the textbook if you're interested. So, so here we kind of have moved now into a situation where we have a forecasted demand situation where the forecasts change. Now recall that we had, we had no assumption on on uh, on uh, a constant demand in our uh, aggregated 
aggregated production planning. So we kind of so there must be something different in this uh, world than the that world. And the main difference here is actually this this con concept of setup costs because these setup costs they they happen when you produce. So you can't kind of use the standard way of modeling it. You can't take a constant and multiply it by a variable to produce that kind of cost. It's kind of cost that comes, it looks something like this. If, if I produce now in period four, not in five, not in six, not in seven, but in eight, then I get my setup cost. I get nothing here, but then suddenly it comes again here. Okay. Now if I do it the same in nine, then it comes here, but not necessarily so. So it's kind of a, a binary cost structure. It kind of either comes or not. And to be able to model that, we have to use some special techniques. And that's the main idea why we look at this. But we will return to that as we move on. Okay, now we just think about this problem as it is. And let us start by looking at how we can... Uh, let me see. Yeah, that's what, what, what exactly what we're going to do. How can we use our EOQ model if we want to find an approximate solution to this problem. But in order to do that we have to be uh, perhaps a bit more structured about our problem. So now we have a setup cost. So each time we produce this cost of 132 something comes. Okay? If we don't produce then it does not come. And then we have some inventory costs and in this case it's given as 0 0.60 so it's quite much smaller than the, the set of cost and if we think about the structure these are the only two, two cost elements we have it should be fairly straightforward to, to get a grasp on what kind of trade-off we talk about here one option obviously here for me is to produce the exact numbers which are on the on the forecast. I can I can decide to produce 42 in period 4, 42 in period 5 and so on. If I do that, I get no inventory cost. I don't have to put anything on the inventory, but of course I get a great deal of setups. Each time I produce, I have to bear these costs. So this kind of strategy which often is referred to as an LFL, a lot for lot strategy. You see, there are different names on the same thing, you know. Previously, when we discussed this in the aggr aggregated production planning sense, we called it a zero inventory plan or a minimal inventory plan. Now it has a new name. It's called a lot for lot. There is also a third name referred to as chase demand strategy. So there's a lot of different names on the same thing. But this is the easiest way to produce, isn't it? You just kind of, or it's, it's even called make to order, I think. So there's a lot of different names on the same, same, same thing here. We can, of course, calculate the cost for this lot for lot strategy. That's straightforward. There will be a setup in each of the periods here. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten periods, isn't it? So the cost. This is often written like L, F, L, lot for lot. The cost of the L, F, L plan is easily calculated by taking our setup cost and multiply by the number of setups, 132 times 10, which then is 1320. So this is one kind of total production cost we could end up with if we use this strategy. Of course, the question is, could we produce other strategies which has impact on the total cost. Of course, that's again obvious. You, you kind of see the trade-off here, don't you? Either you use very little inventory, a high cost on the on the. If you can, we draw a kind of figure here, which tells us how this is. Um, if we have number of ah. Maybe it's not that easy. Maybe it's just confusing. If I produce very often, I get a very high setup cost. Okay. If I produce very seldom, I get a very low 
On the other hand, if I produce very seldom, I get a very low setup cost, but I get a very high inventory cost. On the other hand, if I produce very often, I get a very low inventory cost, but a very high setup cost. Okay, so there is a kind of trade-off. There should be somewhere in between here where I can kind of mix these costs and it should depend on these numbers. Okay? How is the kind of relation between these two? If this one is extremely high compared to that one, much higher than this one, 1 million 320,000, then I would be very careful with doing my setups, don't you think so? Then I would try to produce everything in the first period, just and then store it all through the periods. On the other hand, if this other cost is relatively high, we would be very careful with that kind of strategy. So, so you see how this works, but we need some kind of methods to, to handle it. And what we will do now is that we will first, we have already looked at the simplest possible solution, and now we will use our EOQ and see if we are able to improve this solution. So we kind of adapt our EOQ model into production. We calculate the optimal order quantity, or actually optimal production quantity in that case, and we try to adapt that into the situation and see if we can produce an easy solution. Then after that, we will look at a specialized heuristic, which is the kind of algorithm which somebody has come up with, which turns out to be even better. It's relatively easy, so we spend a little time on looking through it. Okay. And then in the end, we will do a mathematical programming formulation, meaning that we will look at something similar to the model we looked at in aggregate production planning, but we have to kind of deal with this setup cost in a special way. That it kind of opens up a whole new world in the sense for modeling here. So uh, then we take a break. Yeah. Now I think I will turn off the camera. <laughs>